My name is Dionysus Rogers. This is a talk originally presented at the American Academy of Religion meetings in 2008. I would ask that you permit me to begin with a suitable invocation from issue 120 of Strange Tales. In the name of the dread Dormammu, by the hosts of the Hore Hoggoth, I call upon the mystic realm. Let the fury of the ageless Vishanti show itself. Thus I command, by the twelve moons of Munapur, my will must be done. Religion has gained an increasingly visible profile in comic books, particularly with the explicit and ongoing reorientation toward adult markets and the proliferation of smaller publishers in the medium. For example, here is the cover of a collection of the comic book, Testament, a work that its writer, Douglas Rushkoff, refers to as open source Judaism, a sort of cyberpunk version of the Hebrew Bible. The specialization of the comics medium creates openings for explicitly religious content. For most of its 20th century history, however, the comic book, a few illustrated evangelical tracts notwithstanding, was viewed as the antithesis of religious literature. Here, by the way, are images from some of those tracts by the notorious Jack Chick. But these aren't really comic books sold as such to comics readers. For many decades, the public and policymakers regarded comics as a vulgar and debased medium, posing a particular threat to the children for whom alone illustrated stories were suitable. Critics and theorists universally approached comics in terms of their danger to religion, morality, and general decency. Various threats of government intervention culminated in a draconian comics code for self-policing of the industry. It had many stipulations, but I will summarize the key features. Good guys must always win, and bad guys must not be glamorized. There must be no representations of corrupt cops or politicians to weaken respect for authority. And there shall be no sex or seduction of any kind, Comics must include no lurid or gruesome illustrations, and thus we have the development of the bloodless so-called comic book violence. There is to be no use of the words horror or terror in the title of a comic. And finally, no vampires, zombies, ghouls, or werewolves. Now, the most conspicuous supernatural elements to be highlighted in the mid-20th century comics were those of the very successful horror comics, these being shut down with the advent of the Comics Code. Now, here is a beautifully self-referential example with the comics creator himself being visited by the products of his imagination. Now, in the comics code environment of the late 50s and 60s, strange and weird became code words for the prohibited horror and terror. While, at the same time, religious concepts and themes started to appear among the capes and leotards of popular superhero comics. And one of the ways in which they made their appearance was through the avenue of storylines and characters rooted in occultism. In particular, I'll focus in this discussion on the Marvel superhero character, Doctor Strange, because his development is synchronous with what Mircea Eliade called the growing interest in the occult, which started in the 60s and it paved the way for the occult explosion of the 70s. The object at hand, then, is to examine a syndrome of secularized religion in the popular medium of comics while making some further observations about the attributes of doctrines, practices, and material culture in the so-called occult explosion. In a nutshell, our chief character begins as Dr. Stephen Strange, an arrogant former surgeon whose hands were irreparably injured in an accident. On a quest for a cure, 
he finally climbs a high mountain in Asia and becomes the disciple of a character known only as the Ancient One. Having attained humility and the powers of a master of the mystic arts, he returns to New York, establishing a so-called Sanctum Sanctorum in a Victorian house in Greenwich Village with his manservant Wong, and he then goes on to battle malign occult forces from that base. Or as we can see from these panels, more pedestrian challenges, such as hemorrhoids. Now, Strange also acquires a disciple named Clea, who is a princess from another dimension. Eventually, the Ancient One surrenders his terrestrial life and passes to Doctor Strange the office of Sorcerer Supreme, chief occult defender of the planet. This origin story narrative shows an impressively full development of the Oriental monk trope of American popular culture. Analyzed by Jane Naomi Iwamura, particularly the prominence phase of the trope's development in which the aged Oriental master confers mysterious powers on an up-and-coming Euro-American. The basic Doctor Strange narrative also takes advantage of widespread ideas from American occultism, first popularized by the Theosophical Society. These ideas include, but were hardly limited to, syncretic esotericism, combining Western, Hermetic, and Neoplatonic ideas with Asian symbols and myths, and adding entirely original, non-traditional elements. A belief in the guidance of secret Indian and Tibetan masters called Mahatmas, and an interest in mediumistic communication with elementals or other spirits. The Asian attired popular occultism that circulated out from the Theosophical Society and its derivative groups remained a distinctive element in non-normative American religion. But it was reactivated and reinforced by the increased presence of practitioners and teachers of Asian religions in the US after 1965, when immigration law was changed to afford parity between Asian and European entry to the Americas. Doctor Strange was first created in 1962 by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Writer Stan Lee became a principal editor and the eventual public face of Marvel Comics in later decades. His religious background, like that of the creators of Superman and many other famous superheroes, was Jewish. Artist Steve Ditko also contributed to the original character narratives as well as the visual concepts of the stories. He has not been public about his religious upbringing or beliefs, but he does espouse the rationalist and egoist philosophy of Ayn Rand's objectivism. A later writer said, Ditko was always the weird guy working in the corner sort of artist. Lee and Ditko had also collaborated in the genesis of Spider-Man. They were key creative players in the Silver Age of comics, which addressed itself to baby boomers. So Doctor Strange, grew up with the American youth counterculture, and vice versa. During the 60s and 70s, all comics characters were owned by the publishers, and so other writers and artists succeeded the work of Lee and Ditko on Doctor Strange. Steve Englehart wrote a defining series of the comics in the early 70s, in which the Ancient One died and Strange became the Sorcerer Supreme. Englehart worked with artists Frank Brunner and Gene Colan, Jim DeMattis wrote Doctor Strange stories a little later on, and I want to share from him a particularly relevant quote about his work on the comic. These stories become metaphors. You get to write about the spiritual reality in a way that is concrete to the audience, and yet the metaphysical underpinnings are all still there. And here's a quote from an interview with artist P. Craig Russell. There's a book of ritual hand poses of the Buddhist priests. They were drawn in the 1920s by a woman who went into the secret sects and did illustrations of the different hand poses they used. I drew on that for the first time in the Doctor Strange annual that I did. Another source I had was a book I found in the Wellsville Public Library on thought forms of the Theosophists. It was filled with little paintings of what, on a purely mental plane, greed and joy and anger and such looked like. Now, the message of this panel by comics theorist Scott McCloud is that comics creators don't directly highlight their own personalities. But my goodness, what a, what a scene. We have uh, Jewish Stan Lee placing Strange and Clea together with the Norse pagan Valkyrie uh, to wish 
Hulk, A Merry Christmas. Not only creators and producers determined the esoteric significance of Doctor Strange, it was also influenced by consumers. The doctrinal components of Doctor Strange's mystic arts were originally very vague and flexible. His invocations and spells were composed for rhetorical value only. As Stan Lee explained, I tried to make up incantations that sounded like they meant something, like, let's see if I can remember them, by the hoary hosts of Hoggoth, or let's see, by the shades of the shadowy seraphim, anything that sounded mysterious to me. Comics readers built significance behind these originally empty signifiers. In 1977, fan Catherine Ironwood produced a handwritten manuscript called The Lesser Book of the Vishanti that inventoried the fictional entities and powers of the Doctor Strange stories. She later printed it up herself and sent copies to other comics fans. It gained a reputation, and the Doctor Strange writers requested copies from the author, eventually using some of her ideas and speculations in the ongoing series. Now, an example of Ironwood's work is her analysis of Doctor Strange's principal amulet, the all-seeing eye of Agamotto. She cataloged its variant names and six of its documented powers, and then speculated on its quote-unquote real-world origins. She claimed that Ditko had derived the image of the amulet of Agamotto from a fairly common kind of amulet found in the Buddhist regions of northern India. Around the eye itself, there is a circle of 16 smaller circular bosses, which on close inspection proved to be representations of small snail shells. These refer to a celebrated incident in the life of Buddha when he became engrossed in meditation while sitting in the hot sun and was in danger of dying from heat stroke until a band of devoted snails crawled up onto his head and gave their lives by secreting mucus until they had cooled his head. In this Doctor Strange graphic novel panel, painted by artist Dan Green, we can see a visual citation of this 17th century engraving of a book from Bamanist mysticism as an instance of the visual influence of Western religious traditions, as well as Eastern ones. In Eliot's essay on occultism, he refers to the expertise of scholar Robert Elwood regarding the diversity of American occultism and occultist groups. In Elwood's book, Alternative Altars, Unconventional and Eastern Spirituality in America, he treats the Theosophical Society as a major case study of what he calls emergent religion. Elwood is dissatisfied with the church-sect distinction that sociology of religion receives from Ernst Trilch, and he proposes instead the temple and the cave. The temple is establishment religion, perpetuated through stable families and communities and growing through conversion. The cave is the oppositional religion of the mysteries, perpetuated through elaborate systems of initiation and often going underground altogether as its communities and institutions dissolve, while leaving still durable marks on the culture. Elwood also calls the American religion of the cave excursus, the basic meaning of which indicates phenomena of quest and pilgrimage. He remarks these further features as, as typical of excursus religion, all of which become evident in Doctor Strange. Uh, one feature, uh, participants tend to work in small, close-knit groups, like the various superhero teams to which Doctor Strange has been assigned or in lonely isolation, as Doctor Strange often is. Excursus practitioners often use imposing personal titles like Sorcerer Supreme. Seeking and self-development are evident in the original Doctor Strange story and re-emphasized in later plots. Doctor Strange stories also use a hierarchical, non-dualist cosmology typical of excursus. And excursus, like Doctor Strange, is often characterized by a doctrine of multiple worlds or realities. One of the Doctor Strange writers claimed that 90% of the other dimensions in comic books come from Ditko's Doctor Strange. A key to the idea of other dimensions in Doctor Strange stories is his ability to exteriorize his astral body or double, an esoteric concept that goes back to Neoplatonism and appears in Theosophy and other forms of modern occultism. In a very literal sense of excursus, this astral form could pass into non-material dimensions via the astral plane. Ditko's distinctive visual representations of such travel created a lexicon of visionary images that comics 
artists still draw on when they want to represent magical realms and energies. Now here we have a panel from the end of such a journey in which the coming down narration seems to be a deliberate allusion to a psychedelic drug trip by the writer Steve Englehart, who said that many of his ideas for comics during this period came from LSD experiences with his friends. Now, founding Theosophist Blavatsky often smoked hashish, and various occultists have used mescaline and other drugs to facilitate visionary experiences throughout the modern period, and earlier too, no doubt. A more common form of visionary excursus is the sleeping dream. Doctor Strange could magically enter into the world of dreams and interact with its phantasms, including its native son, Nightmare, one of his chief supernatural foes. Dreams have an illustrious history in comics, since Windsor McKay's pre-World War I newspaper feature, Little Nemo and Slumberland, explored psychological issues and pushed the boundaries of the comics medium. In the 1990s, Rick Veitch used his self-published Rare Bit Fiends to evangelize for autobiographical dream comics as, quote, the intuitive art form. In Doctor Strange, Expressionistic representations of dreams and visions led to innovative visual organization of the comics page, as we see in this example from artist Gene Colan. Another feature of excursus religion in Doctor Strange that came to affect the entire superhero comics tradition was the introduction of a cosmic hierarchy of personified forces, up to and including the inscrutable eternity. Notice the uh, crucifixion of Jesus in the lower left corner of the page. Now, Doctor Strange has never much catered to Christians, though, nor the other way around. In 1990, Christian pop music singer Amy Grant filed suit against Marvel Comics for allegedly using her image on a Doctor Strange cover, as shown in this comparison image from Christianity Today. She sought monetary damages for the so-called irreparable injury to her reputation because of the occult themes of the comic. Now, despite opposition, occult comics are more popular than ever. Although Doctor Strange has never had the market stamina of a Batman or Spider-Man, he has been a supporting character in many other comics, and his own comic, although dying repeatedly, has shown reliable powers of resurrection, largely because of his attraction for writers and artists. Writer Dematis comments, those of us that had been on our own spiritual search in those years began to bring that even more to this beautiful framework that Lee and Ditko had created. The mystic arts of Doctor Strange were, on one level at least, an allegory for the creative powers of the artists and writers who worked on the comic. The themes of excursus religion showcased by Doctor Strange have been perpetuated now throughout the comics medium. Good examples include the Books of Magic series written by Neil Gaiman, and we see here a visionary encounter with archangels. Uh, another would be the Promethea comics written by professed occult magician and snake worshiper Alan Moore. Using Elwood's sociological polarity of temple and cave, we might view the establishment of superhero character franchises as the temple relative to the cave of horror and occult comics, even as the entire comics medium functions as a supposedly kitsch cave when contrasted with more dominant media and art forms. Since the 1980s, the development of a direct market through special to comic book shops has permitted a greater range of more sophisticated content, but has at the same time moved comics out of the supermarkets and further from the consumer mainstream, an effect mitigated only by the production of movies based on certain popular comics. American comic books in and of themselves are now far more of an excursus literature in the 21st century. And the growing prevalence of occult themes among their contents are consistent with this development. In the absence of 70s style occultist revival, comic books seem to be as suitable a venue as ever for American excursus. Now, to conclude, as I began, with a spell of the master of the mystic arts, I say, It is done. In the name of the venerated ancient one, I dismiss the powers that be. They have served me well.